<laughs> I think I broke Unlike Uncle play. Banzai, we don't have to pay for this by the inch. <laughs> yes. <laughs> they have a live recording of them. Emmaus. Now, you've already seen the intro video, so I'm going to jump right in to the meat of this chapter, assuming that you've already seen the previous video, the intro to this chapter. So we're closing in. We're in the we're in the final section of the book typically called the homecoming section okay because in the in the odyssey after all these adventures odysseus finally gets back to ithaca it starts out with a, a bit of uh, he's in disguise he wants to kind of figure out what's been going on since he's been gone see who's who see who his friends are who his friends aren't what his wife's been up to so he disguises himself and you know we cover that in the previous um, video but he is back in Ithaca the sailing is done okay now what are the themes of this chapter let me give you the 35,000 foot view because this it's not easy to summarize anything in this book you could it's, it's hard to summarize a paragraph in this book let alone a whole chapter um, and that was part of my uh, probably delusion going into this that I could summarize each chapter in 10 minutes and we could get through the whole book. That's turned out not to be true, live and learn. So um, let me see if I can just summarize the chapter. We have three big themes in addition to our other themes, the relationship of fathers and sons, the usurpation, the usual themes, Ireland and stagnation, those are all part of it. Uh, even the uh, stagnation of art and the Irish literary revival and looking back to the past and Parnell and the, the backwards history and all that stuff is all in there. But our three themes of this chapter are disguise because we have our uh, our character who who meets the the um, goat herd you know when Odysseus gets back he disguises himself so nobody knows who he is so that's kind of a theme of this chapter is disguise we could also say a theme is confusion because we're we're tired it's one o'clock in the morning we've just come out of Circe Stephen's been punched so he was knocked out so not only was he drinking all day stone drunk then he's punched and knocked out so Stephen is pretty like us he's <laughs> he's been through it right and he's tired and rummy all right bloom has had a long long day himself and plenty to deal with and he too is uh, getting tired and a little rummy and we see him kind of make mistakes about stuff uh, he talks about uh, there's a line where he says Edison was the inventor of the telescope and then he says no not Edison um, uh, Galileo he corrects it bloom is slipping we're all slipping we're all tired now it's been a long day it's one o'clock in the morning so we have disguise confusion and then we have lies where people are telling us things that are not necessarily true and there may be some truth mixed with the lies but lies are certainly a part of the central theme of this chapter now disguise I just said, as in the Odyssey, we have the character, our central character is in disguise. Odysseus uh, disguises himself so he can get a lay of the land when he returns from his journey. Now, we are faced with trying to decipher 
who is the Odyssean character here? Is it Bloom, who's really not much of a traveler? Or is it this guy Murphy, who is sailed around the world? He's the worldwide sailor. He's had all these adventures. He's seen people eaten by sharks, people knifed. He's seen the natives of uh, Peru or Bolivia or some, something. And, you know, he's had all these experiences. China, uh, the, the Red Sea, he says. He's, he's been to all these various spots. So who is the Odyssean character here? Well, I think you've been able to decipher that, that this guy is a counterfeit. Because when confronted, I, I love it when uh, Bloom says, well, have you seen the Rock of Gibraltar? You know, because that's, he can relate to that. Molly's from there. And then uh, Murphy says, oh, he's, he's tired of rocks. He's tired of rocks and ships and sailors and all, all that stuff. And then he kind of wanders away. So it leaves us to wonder how, how true this is. And when we see the discharge papers, we're not sure that's who this guy is because he doesn't really seem like he's all that knowledgeable as a sailor. And then he shows us the postcard and they pass that around and Bloom notes in his mind that the postcard is not made to him. Uh, it's not addressed to this guy. So, you know, maybe this guy just happened to roll somebody, take their papers and clean them out and get what's in their wallet and take the postcard and, you know, there's some sailor clunked over the head somewhere that this Murphy character has rolled for his money and papers. We don't really know, but we do know that Murphy doesn't seem right. The, the stories just don't add up. So we have that disguise theme and we have the, the Confederate. This guy is not who he seems to be. We have confusion and confusion comes in the writing. The writing can be hard to follow but not hard to follow like in the earlier chapters where it's so complex and there's all these deep references and there's just a lot there and that makes it super hard to follow. This is hard to follow in that there are these massively long run-on sentences that that kind of run in a circle. They they don't make any sense. I love the one, uh, there's one early about the uh, the weather that it's, it's, a, it's a warm night and he goes on and on about the, the, the warm night and then it ends with the being rather cool. So what is it? Is it warm? Is it cool? And um, he t talks about the money in his pocket and taking out the money and that is literally the last of the Mohicans. Well, I don't think it's literally Indians. You know, stuff I referenced in the, in the prior video. So with these long run-on sentences that are convoluted, that kind of run in a circle, don't reach a real conclusion, we have that kind of confusion. Now, you know, we have Stephen is in this kind of a stupor, and so this writing is certainly befitting, but I'm going to have more on the writing in a, in a second here. And our, our narrator, even Joyce, is... A writer in disguise. He disguises himself and his talents with these. Uh, we have the cliches. We have all these trite references, and then we have these run-on sentences, and it just it, it, poor, poor writing. It's the writing of a wannabe writer, and it's it's funny. The the very easy chapter to follow. Very funny writing. But it's, it's disguised, and then Joyce gives us a different style in each chapter, as you've seen up to now. And in this one, he plays the role of disguise. He's, he's um, somebody who is not a writer playing the role of a writer. Okay, so Bloom plays with us a bit on this one. I think it's fascinating the way he does it. Now, what's usually talked about in this book is this father in search of a son, son in search of a father, do they ever get together and do we have this great you know meeting of the minds and aha moment where our characters meet and and resolve each other's uh, missingness. Does, does Bloom find the son he lost in Ruby and does uh, Stephen find the father that uh, his father Simon never was? I 
am not a subscriber that that is really central to this book. I think it's important from a perspective of the Odyssey, but Odysseus is trying to get home. He's not questing for a son. He's not looking for his son. He's trying to get home. And I believe Bloom and Stephen are trying to get home. Stephen's home is maybe different, but Bloom is trying to get home. He's trying to retake his home because he's been usurped. Stephen has been usurped from his home as well. They're both wanderers, but I think that the, the main core theme is not a father in search of a son, but Odysseus retaking his home territory. And I think Bloom is retaking control of his home, and that's what this is all about. So the father-son thing doesn't really work, and Joyce lets us know it doesn't work. We see these two characters try to connect, you know, when they're first arriving at the cab stand. Um, Bloom says, he's talking about the guys that are arguing in Italian, and he says it's such a beautiful li uh, language, and you should think about writing your poetry in that language. And Stephen is groggy, and he says, you know, they're, they're arguing about money. So there's, a, there's like no connection there. You know, Bloom is trying to reach Stephen on some level, and he's, he's missing. He's missing him frequently in these various references he makes. As, as they approach the cab stand, uh, Bloom runs, uh, Stephen runs into this guy that he knows, a friend of his, Corley, asks him for money, and um, uh, Stephen gets in a conversation with him, and Bloom sort of hangs back, and then he worries that maybe it's a, a robber, the guy's going to knock him over the head, or something else is going to happen. The protective instincts come out in Bloom, and he worries about the, the money, and yet he's... Uh, helpless to do anything. Stephen gives him a half a crown, which is a good chunk of the money he has left, and that's a month's pay, by the way, so he's got a month's pay on him. He's practically run it all out. He's spent at least half of it, and now he's given away the final portions. So, you know, Bloom is powerless to help him there uh, in that front either, so they're not able to ever well, not able to connect, I shouldn't say ever, because they do make a mental connection later, but they just don't seem to hook up on stuff. Soon, Bloom begins to sound like his father. You know, when we look at the apparitions of Bloom's father that have come out, the ghosts in Circe, where his father scolds him for being out with the goy and getting drunk and ruining your best clothes and, and being at the with the uh, bordello and the ladies of the night, and that's no place for you, Leopold. Now we see Leopold Bloom talking to Stephen and giving him the same advice, telling him to avoid the horrors of Dublin, and uh, especially when you're drinking, and it destroys the body, and you know he gives him virtually the same lecture that we see Bloom's father give him. And we see Stephen make an interesting statement about the uh, about the horse that they they um, oh how's it go it's it, it they they give oh it's it's about uh, um, what they pay dearly for they give cheap you know and I, I think there's a big line there that they, they pay with their life, their health, their everything, and they, they give away cheap. So they pay dearly and, and give uh, cheaply. And, um, you know, Bloom, they just don't connect on anything. And so when, when Bloom tries to get Stephen to understand that, that he's throwing his life away, Bloom sees it as, you know, the... the uh, ladies of the evening are destroying themselves. It doesn't, he doesn't get it, doesn't connect. Now, also, when Stephen runs into this guy, Corley, he gives him some money, and then, you know, Bloom asks him, what was that all about? And he says, well, he has no place to stay, so I gave him some money. And then Bloom says, well, t neither do you. You know, Bloom is like 
trying to do the fatherly thing and trying to wake him up and you know Stephen has nowhere to go now something about that exchange with the money that always fascinates me is that he didn't give any money to his own sister you know that she was starving her dresses her dress was in tatters she had nothing to eat and she was out basically pawning clothing boots books to get money for food and Stephen gives her nothing and then he runs into this drunk guy at one o'clock in the morning and he's got a half a crown for this guy now a half a crown for the kids would be a lot of food that would have done them a lot of good he doesn't even consider it but he he feels for himself uh, Stephen does he feels for himself and that he's being pulled down remember he sees her hair as seaweed wrapped around his neck pulling him under he worries about himself and like ha helping his sister will drown him so Stephen's got a ways to go he's he's not matured much though I see Bloom has matured a, or or wake awakened a great deal I, I see that Bloom has come a long way and he's dealt with his issues he's faced them and he's a changed guy now if we t t talk for a second about Joyce Joyce wrote and said that the important things for a novel are the important things to write about or the, the 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 important stuff in life are the mundane everyday simple things and he liked to write about those things it, and that's where Joyce said the profound stuff happens now if you look at this book we have an account of a day in Dublin that's in incredible detail we have the timings are accurate the where the characters are are accurate if they set out walking they will meet each other accurately we have so much accuracy in the mundane detail now contrast that with the newspaper that Bloom uh, brings out and he's there it's the daily pink which is the last edition of the day so he's reading this paper and we tend to think of journalism as being the, the accurate part of writing, right? So the novel is for fantasy and journalism is for reality. And what Joyce is telling us here is that art or the, the, the real stuff is in, in the art. I, I want to say in the novel, but I think Joyce means more than in the novel it's in the artist's writing is where you really get the the true stuff the newspaper is riddled with mistakes we have the um, obituary of Patty Dignam Bloom's name is misspelled we have the in attendance is L. Boom Stephen is also uh, listed as being in attendance he was certainly not there uh, McCoy is listed as being in attendance he was not there this guy Macintosh is listed as being in attendance he was not he was there but it's not his name he was not there in that sense and that there was nobody in attendance named Macintosh so the newspaper gets it all wrong and then they give a the, the account of Dignam and how the whole Dublin was shocked and missed their great friend and he was a wonderful person and all this stuff I don't get that any of that's true I don't get that, that I mean we have some references here where some of these guys didn't even know he was dead so it's not like the whole Dublin was shocked at the loss of Patty Dignam he's just some minor clerk third-rate clerk in a in a firm who died from drinking It's just another Dubliner and uh, so Joyce is he's letting us know that you know who gets it right is it the artist that gives you the message does he get it right or is it journalism you know what of writing where is the truth is it in journalism or is it in the in the novel or in the writer or the artist do we find truth in reporting or in art where do we find truth and Joyce would have us uh, believe that truth is in the interpretation and in the presentation of the artist rather than the journalist food for thought draw your own conclusions
as I said, the, the advice that Bloom gives Stephen bounces off. I think I need to just abandon these notes because they're distracting me and I have so many things I want to say. All of Bloom's advice in this uh, chapter falls short. We keep missing the, the connection. They connect Stephen and Bloom on two big points only. Only. Bloom says to Stephen about his friends that his friends have all, they all abandon you. They all ran off. And he even suggests that maybe Mulligan put something in his drink to knock him out so they could get him, you know, he's buying drinks and so they get his, they get his money and they get him to buy drinks and they knock him out and they ditch him. And even Lynch, when the, when he gets in the scuffle with these uh, British officers, uh, not officers, but the British uh, military guys, privates, um, when, when Stephen gets punched, uh, Lynch takes off. He flees, flees the scene. And Stephen says, Judas, calls him Judas. Now, when Bloom brings this up, that your friends have all abandoned you, Stephen comes out of his stupor and he thinks, yeah, Judas. They connect on that point, which I think is very, very important. And the other place they connect is that Bloom recounts to Stephen his encounter with the citizen. And Bloom tells Stephen that, that, you know, he and the citizen got into it. And, and Bloom says, you know, I told him that, you know, your God is a Jew like me. And then he says, you know, was I, was I wrong in that? And, and Stephen, you know, thanks for a minute. And then he tells him, he, he gives this Latin reference uh, from Paul uh, about the people of Christ and Christ proceeding from the Jewish people. Now, this is, this is taught in Catholicism. I was raised a Catholic. I remember this teaching quite vividly that the, the new chosen people are the followers of Christ and they proceeded from the Jewish people. So they came from the Jewish people, right? So they, the Jewish people delivered up the Messiah and the followers of the Messiah are the new chosen people, but the chosen people were from the Jewish people. Common teaching in Christianity, particularly emphasized in the Catholic teaching. So Stephen makes this reference back to Bloom and and Bloom feels the connection with Stephen. Now these guys both are connecting on essentially the same thing. When when Stephen says that that Lynch is a Judas, that he's abandoned by all his friends, that's what Bloom is saying that everybody has abandoned him, and that you know the citizen has mocked him. Now to, this is not something Bloom talks about. He doesn't when they they make Jewish references and pick on him. He never stands up for himself. But now he feels a certain satisfaction that Stephen gets it. So he feels this connection and they're both connecting on this sort of, they're both wanderers, they're both usurped, they're both outcasts, they're both substandard people. They're connecting on that biblical place, all right? Which I think is very interesting. They're, they're displaced and usurped, both of them. All right, so there's plenty of other stuff in this chapter. I think you probably can follow it and figure it out. I want to uh, clarify on this skin the goat thing, what that's about. There was a, um, the, the Viceroy was stabbed to death in uh, Victory Park. I think it was Victory Park uh, by this group that was uh, rebels. They were going for a free Ireland, so they killed the representative of the British government. There was a guy that just drove the getaway car. So they have the trial that the attackers are convicted and they're all uh, hanged. And this one guy who was young that just drove the getaway car really wasn't involved in the whole death plot. He just drove the getaway car. He was arrested. He did 20 years in jail, and that's Skin the Goat, and that was his name. It's uh, Fitzroy, I believe, or yeah, Fitzroy, I think is his name, 
and uh, his nickname was Skin the Goat, and so there is this thing that this guy might be that character, that Skin the Goat, because he'd be out of prison now, and he'd be sort of underground. He wouldn't be out in public notoriety. So maybe he is, maybe he isn't. We have a lot of Confederate characters, but that's the Skin the Goat thing. We have the the prostitute that sort of is on the outskirts. We see her looking in and trying to lure people out. You know, she tries to get the skin the goat guy to come out, you know, come join her. She tries to get Murphy out. Now, Murphy does wander outside into the dark for a while. He uh, uh, takes a leak outside on the ground, and he uh, spits out some chewing tobacco and possibly... Uh, rendezvous with this prostitute or maybe he's working with her we don't really know what their relationship is there's something not right with this Murphy guy and his stories don't all add up so there's something wrong there and then we have this prostitute hanging around the side which D D Bloom says she's just filthy and how could she even make a living at her trade as as filthy as she is which is sad and touching and gross but it also tells us since Circe these these uh, dark demonic apparition type characters are no longer able to get at Bloom we we clearly see that now because in the past chapters they're able to confront him humiliate him uh, bring him down here we see that they can't, they keep the distance. It's it's almost like, you know, the old potato thing. He's got the potato back and they can't touch him so that this prostitute is out of the picture, has no, no pull on him. So, you know, that's our summation of the chapter. Now, as as the chapter approaches the end, we get our characters together. Are we satisfied in that? You know, do, do we feel satisfaction that Bloom and Stephen have finally connected? They finally gotten together. Well, it's not a very satisfying reunion. We don't see like this arm in arm, happy go lucky pair that connect mentally and they start talking sports and yeah, why don't you stay at my house? Yeah, you can crash on the couch and then they become pals for life. We don't see that happening. It's rather unfulfilling for us. Or 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 is it? I think we're going to find out more in the next chapter. But there is something very touching that we should get. Now I hope I can deliver this without getting choked up. As they leave the stand, Bloom says to Stephen, he's going to take him home and and we're finally going to get home and it's been a long trek since Bloom has left home but Bloom says to Stephen come it's not far lean on me and they go into the dark that really gets me I mean that's Joyce has really done it in most novels, you would want to, you have your climax, then resolution, right? We don't have that. We don't have resolution. These guys are not pals for life. We haven't seen this big connection, except on those two points that I mentioned. But we don't get a sense that they're going to be pals for life. I don't see that happening. It's rather unfulfilling in that sense. But it's very touching because Bloom is still Bloom. He's still the caregiver. He's still looking out for others. He's still caring about Stephen. I think at this point, Bloom is kind of getting that the big connection isn't going to be there. He'd like it to be. He'd like to mentor Stephen. But I don't think he sees it happening. And Stephen certainly doesn't. And for the reader, I don't think we see a big connection and, and have this grand fulfillment either. But I think that line, you know, come, it's not far, lean on me, is pretty beautiful stuff. So what can I say? You know, how do I, how do I wrap this chapter up? 
<laughs> I want to say when I started this I thought this will be easy. I'll just do little 10 minute videos, a little summary of each chapter, and it'll be easy for you to read the book. Oh, it's a, you know, 10 minutes each chapter, give you a little synopsis, aha, you know what's going on, you'll zip right through it. So after the first two chapters, I realized that wasn't going to happen because it was difficult to get it down, and then the videos became 40 minutes, and then two parts of uh, 40 minutes and 30 minutes, and you know, you just can't summarize this book, right? About halfway through, I switched from thinking this is going to be very easy to, I don't think I can do this. <laughs> I don't know I'm going to make it. I don't think I can get all the way through. I mean, these chapters are hard. What am I going to do when we get to Oxen and Circe? Um, how am I going to deal with that? And then we made it. And now we're here, and now I feel like there's only two more chapters left, and they're pretty easy. And I don't want this to end. You know, I really enjoy hearing from you. I've enjoyed this odyssey that we're on, and I feel our journey shrinking down that we're almost there. I love hearing from you. So when you leave me comments, it 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 means a lot to me. Okay? This channel is not monetized. I'm not trying to get 80 billion subscribers. You know, we're not even as of today, we're not even at 100 yet. <laughs> you know, so I don't see 20,000 subscribers and uh, you know, $100,000 checks coming from YouTube. I love hearing that you're in New York, you're in Dublin, you're, you're in France, Italy, Africa, China, Singapore, Canada. I mean, this thrills me no end to hear from you and hear where you're from. I love that. And so please leave a comment. I love hearing from you. I have started putting my address in the uh, description. Uh, you can write me at my business if you'd like to write. I'd love to get it. To, you know, it'd be neat to have a wall full of cards from people all over the world that read Ulysses. That would be cool. So I, this is not something I'm ever going to ask for money. I don't want a Patreon thing or any of that jazz or PayPal donations. I don't want that. I want people to read, experience the humanities, and enjoy this book. So I feel that our own odyssey is coming now near completion. We're almost home, right? So I thank you. I want to encourage you to uh, hang on. Two chapters left, and uh, wow, well, it's going to be sad to finish this, but I'm, I'm proud we've made it. We've made it through all the hard stuff, and the last two chapters are pretty easy going. Uh, Molly's chapter is pretty long, and the next chapter might be a little confusing in the style, but it's easy to follow and it's rather interesting. So drop me a comment, subscribe if you like, uh, thumbs up, those help, and as always, Slancha. See you next time. <laughs>